Thank you so much to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. Coming soon to Own On Video. It was the 90s when straight to video movies became a lucrative market. While these were mocked for their low quality and shoddy production values, they still turned into huge profits. And while the concept of straight to video has been around since the 80s, one could argue it didn't take off until 1994 with the release of Disney's direct to video sequel to their then most popular film, Aladdin, called The Return of Jafar. The film was a hit, selling 15 million copies, and Disney would spend the rest of the decade dominating the market with their long line of direct to video sequels that brought in the big bucks. Pocahontas 2, Lion King 2, Cinderella 2, Little Mermaid 2, and so on and so on. Other children slash family franchises would also get in the act. Since the long line of Later Before Time sequels, home videos aimed at preschoolers based on the hit television series Barney and Friends, CG animated films starring Mattel's Barbie, movie star the then popular Olsen twins, as well as sequels to films that originally underperformed at the box office on its original release but became sleeper hits on home video, like The Swamp Princess. Ghosts and werewolves are scary, but you know what's even scarier? A hacker. Thankfully, ExpressVPN encrypts your network data through their secure encryption servers, preventing them from stealing your personal information. ExpressVPN protects you and your info on any device, laptops, iPad, Androids, iPhone, you name it. It's the best VPN out there. You don't have to take my word for it. Just ask TechRadar as they voted it number one, praising its performance, customer support, and convenience. You could get your three months free today. Thanks again for ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. Now, on with the show. It was deep into the mid-90s. Hanna-Barbera were ready to revitalize their classic characters while simultaneously creating new TV shows for the then-new cable channel, Cartoon Network. Ideas were tossed around such as a Jetsons revival and a Top Cat revival, which Seth MacFarlane was involved. Scooby-Doo, who had a resurgence in popularity at the time, was given top priority due to his high Q score. As HB's parent company, Turner, was merged into Time Warner, Warner Brothers would focus their attention on the most popular Hanna-Barbera character, that meddling mutt Scooby, starting with a new movie. Funny enough, this was just around the time the marketing blitz for the Johnny Quest revival bombed hard. Keep in mind, despite Scooby's popularity and reruns on Cartoon Network, the franchise was pretty much dormant for the most of the 90s. The only other new Scooby production was the Hanna-Barbera crossover TV movie, The Forgotten Arabian Nights. The idea was for this new film to have a theatrical release, but WB wanted this to be a dual format release for Warner Home Video instead. This will result in the first of a long line of Scooby-Doo DTVs, and my personal favorite, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, which will be followed by Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghosts, Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders, and Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase. These films feature the Mystery Inc. gang, reimagined as young adults, who go up against real supernatural threats. They were darker, had more threatening villains, and had animation that was definitely a departure from the classic cartoons. Props to Japanese animation studio, Mook, who did work on other Hanna-Barbera projects, like The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest and SWAT Cats. The films also had huge marketing campaigns. I praise Zombie Island enough, so I'm not gonna linger. But when I think of the dark Scooby-Doo done right, this is the first that comes to mind. The atmosphere, the characters, the tone, the music, everything was just perfect. Their performances were also phenomenal. Frank Welker, the only original cast member to return, Scott Ennis, Billy West, the late Mary Kay Bergman, and BJ Ward all do a great job of bringing new life into the classic gang. Witches Ghost is also a fun time in which the highlights include the introduction of the three most popular recurring characters in the franchise, the Hex Girls, as well as a memorable Tim Curry performance. But he's Tim Curry, he's always amazing. Alien Invaders is definitely the most underrated of the films. The best part of the movie is Shaggy and Scooby's relationship with a photographer named Crystal and her dog Amber, who turn out to be real aliens, who in a twist are the good guys, while the fake aliens turn out to be South agents who are scaring away people from the gold they found. You really feel for Shaggy and Scooby here, and you believe they're in love too. 
even putting their cowardly instincts aside to protect them, or at least attempt to protect them. It's really sweet. The fake aliens have memorable design too. I always thought their heads looked like broccoli. I'm actually surprised how groovy is in a well-known song in our fan base. Listening to it again is actually a very nice tune, and Scott Ennis really sells it. The weakest of the films would definitely have to be Cyber Chase. I loved this film growing up, but watching it as an adult, I do see more of the flaws. The idea is really cool, with Mystery Inc. being zapped in their college friend's computer game while chasing a deadly fan of virus. The settings and environments during each level are very creative. But a lot of things don't make sense. Why would the inventor of the virus be dumb enough to give it a love of baseball like him? And say if he was able to scare Eric off successfully and win the prize money, what would he have done about the deadly virus walking around? Shaggy for some reason doesn't notice his long metal magnet in his pocket he could have used any time? Even a fan of virus, while he does have a nice design and voiced by a great actor, he's a little inconsistent. Sometimes he can be very threatening, but other times he's a slapstick clown. The best part of the whole movie is the gang meeting their cyber counterparts, which are their teen selves from the original series, though Cyber Shaggy has his 13th ghost attire. Seeing them all interact and work together, I'll admit it's pretty cool. It's in no way horrible, and it's definitely the best looking of the films visually, but out of all four of the early films, this is one I simply like for nostalgia. All these movies will premiere on Cartoon Network's Cartoon Theater blog a month after their home video release and garner big ratings for the channel. For reasons we won't get into here, Cyber Chase was the last Scooby production held by the original crew of the films, headed by Davis Doy. A new writer was forced on the team, which led to them departing. At the same time, Hanna-Barbera would be absorbed into Warner Brothers animation after William Hanna's death. Prior to that, HB and WB operated separately, with most of HB's productions, namely the early Scooby movies, made at the Imperial Bank building. With a new WB animation head, the next Scooby movie onward will be fully made by Warner Brothers Animation. Scott Geralds, a huge Scooby-Doo fan since his childhood and who worked on several Scooby-Doo shows in the late 80s, would helm the next two films. Scooby-Doo and the Legend of the Vampire, and Scooby-Doo and the Monster of Mexico. These movies went back to basics. The darker tone was gone, and the films would be a throwback to the original Where Are You series, complete with the return of old sound effects, remixes of Ted Nichols' original score, and a much more flat art style similar to the original series, and a return of the original voice cast, with the notable exception of the deceased Don Messick. The game were de-aged back to teenagers again, and were given the original outfits and the original Mystery Machine again. In addition, the real monsters gimmick was dropped, and it was back to the guy in a mask formula. As a kid, I was conflicted on this change. Sure, I love and adore Where Are You, but I was just getting used to the more darker films. Legend of the Vampire was definitely my favorite of the two. I remember getting it on my 10th birthday. I love the Australia setting, and Daniel and his grandfather, Malcolm, are great characters. It was even nice to see the Hex Girls again, even if their inclusion doesn't make much sense continuity-wise. It's a good movie, but I'm not gonna lie, I would've definitely loved the original scrap plot more. I don't have much thoughts on Monster of Mexico. It's one of the Scooby movies I could take or leave. I remember watching it when it premiered on Cartoon Network's May Movie Month, and not really much was memorable. I guess there is some expanded culture for kids, which is always nice. Well, on to the next era. On September 14th, 2002, Scooby-Doo made his much-anticipated return to Saturday morning in What's New Scooby-Doo, which aired on Kids WB from 2002 to 2006. Because of this, the directed video movies would be made in the same style as What's New for the rest of the decade, even when the show ended. These movies were, for the most part, extended episodes of What's New, but that doesn't make it a bad thing. Several of them were actually entertaining, like Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster, which featured a game in Scotland visiting Daphne's cousin and going after the legendary Loch Ness Monster, terrorizing the town just in time for the Highland Games. I remember this movie for its memorable chase scenes. They're really well done. Aloha, Where's My Mummy, Pirates Ahoy, Chill Out, and Samurai Sword, they're okay in my opinion, but there are some things I love about each movie. Virginia Madsen is over the top as Cleopatra in Where's My Mummy. I love the designs of the Tiki Monsters in Aloha and Hawaiian setting. Fred's parents in Pirates Ahoy are pretty likable characters and really are the first I think of when I think about his family. I love some of the side characters, the Abominable Snowman and the Alfred Molina villain 
and chill out, and the fight scenes in Samurai Sword are pretty well done. And the Mayumi character is pretty cute too. My favorite during this era would definitely be Goblin King. The story is really creative. Shaggy and Scooby must travel to the underworld to retrieve a staff from the Goblin King after a magician they pissed off earlier gets magic powers from a fairy he captured who is the Goblin King's daughter. Said staff will put an end to his evil magic, but they must return before sunrise before the whole town becomes cursed forever. The other members of Mystery Inc. are sidelined here and it becomes a Scooby and Shaggy adventure similar to the 80s movies. I like a lot of the ideas here. Like the train they take where they have to disguise as monsters and the cars that can make mythical creatures and objects appear. I love the bar scene which features familiar monsters from Where Are You, The Scooby Doo Show, and What's New. There's a lot of memorable voice talent here too. Wayne Knight as a greedy villain, that's a no brainer. Tim Curry as a Goblin King, how can you go wrong with that? Jim Belushi as a comedic henchman, Wallace Shawn, Jay Leno, Hollywood legend Laura Bacall, and the Heroes era, Hayden Panettiere. It's a lot of fun and I make a point to watch it every Halloween. Some of these movies even have special features on the DVD by National Geographic where the kids at home can learn all about the Loch Ness legend, mummies, and Hawaiian culture. Samurai Sword was the last of the West New Era. Afterwards, Casey Kasem retired for the role of Shaggy. Some of the former directors were to move on to other projects and a new decade was right around the corner. Former Cartoon Network Vice President Sam Register would become an Executive Vice President of Warner Bros. Animation, later being promoted to President in 2020. He would executive produce all the Scooby-Doo directed video movies from here on in. Warner Bros. Animation regulars Spike Brand and Tony Savoni, whose notable work include developing the Duck Doctor series for CN, would direct the first two Scooby-Doo directed video movies of 2010 and would later produce the following three. The last Scooby-Doo movie they directed together would be 2015's Kiss Rock and Roll Mystery. It was also around this time the acclaimed Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated series debuted on Cartoon Network, which they both developed with Mitch Watson. The style of the movies will be a mix of the darker Zombie Island look and a retro Where Are You style, complete with utilizing Iwo Takamoto's design for the classic game, brought to life by the always amazing Dan Haskett. The first film of the new decade was Abracadabra Do, where Scooby and a gang visit Velma's sister who studied at a magic academy haunted by a griffin. Madeline is a fun character and her chemistry with Shaggy is really sweet. The second and my personal favorite of this era is Camp Scare. I love the camp setting, the new characters, the surprise villain, and the shout outs to the Friday the 13th series. Legend of the Phantasaur has a good subplot of Shaggy being under hypnosis and being brave whenever he hears the word bad. And for those wondering, yes this is the one that inspired the altruistic Shaggy memes. Music of the Vampire had good songs, especially done with monsters and Scooby and me. I remember not caring for Big Top that much, but it's fine. With Casey Case's retirement, who will be the new voice of Shaggy? All the past Shaggies would audition to replace Kasem, but it was Matthew Litter from the live action films who won the role. Ironic considering he was embarrassed by the films. If you need to in your retirement years, you can pick up the voice for the future cartoons and things like that. If, I, if it gets that bad, yeah. <laughs> if I end up going off to do cartoons, if this is the end of me, yeah, I, I got Shaggy in my, up my back, up my sleeve. I gotta say, he's really good. Not quite an impression of Casey, but he does make it his own thing. And as much as I love Casey and was glad they were able to keep him as long as they could, you could tell how old he was getting, and it's pretty distracting when you watch some of the later 2000s stuff. Matt Little was able to make Shaggy sound hip and young again. I appreciate Matthew for sticking with the character for so long, and for someone who was originally ashamed of the role, I'm glad he had a change of heart and embraced Shaggy and take the character and the role seriously. Matthew, you the man. The rest of the 2010s decade saw the Scooby-Doo directed video movies an experimental period with different writers and directors, and it becomes apparent they were pretty much given free reign to do whatever they wanted with the series. I remember these films were particularly more self-aware than the previous eras. They would do everything from WWE wrestlers, Legos, puppets, another Batman crossover, Bobby Flay, Kiss, etc. Some ideas were new and inventive, like Mask of the Blue Falcon takes place at a Comic Con with the Blue Falcon from Dynamo Dog Wonder as a washed up actor, and a convention being invaded by the ghost of Mr. Hyde, a villain from that show. I love how Franken Creepy showed villains from the original cartoons teaming up in an elaborate scheme to take down a gang. Though I will admit, the fast editing did get old after a while. Moon Monster Madness had a funny Malcolm McDowell performance, 
and little nods to Alien. And a kiss crossover is so batshit insane and out there, it's kinda humorous. This era has some low points though. I never care for stage fright. Where this American Idol slash America's Got Talent type show takes place, and most of the focus is Daphne and Fred's will they or won't they relationship. And honestly, I don't care. Of course the most good looking members of the gang are gonna get together, get on with it. The romance drama made up the worst parts of Mystery Incorporated too. I don't care for wrestling, but I will admit, I wouldn't know who John Cena was if it wasn't for Wrestlemania Mystery. The Scooby Doo franchise celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2019 with DVD and Blu-ray releases as well as new movies that were throwbacks to classic material. Curse of the 13th Ghost and Return to Zombie Island When I saw the trailer for Curse of the 13th Ghost, I was excited. The 13th Ghost of Scooby Doo was one of my favorite Scooby Doo series and it would be amazing to see what they could do with it, especially wrapping up loose ends. Then I saw it and was disappointed and I know it's weird saying that as an adult, but hear me out. The biggest problem was that the film flat out ignored the real monsters element from the show. The missing 13th ghost turned out to be another guy in a mask, Vincent Van Gogh's friend who we assumed died at the beginning. It seems like it was all for naught. Velma gets so unlikable here it costs me in denial about the real ghost, despite the fact she wasn't even there to witness it. Pretty smug about it too. I was glad to see an older, less annoying flim flam and Maurice LaMarche does a great job imitating Vincent Price but this movie left me feeling cold. Though the worst of the series would definitely be Return to Zombie Island. It's generally bad and should just be avoided. The sheriff from the last movie who forbid the gang to solve any more mysteries suggests they take a vacation to take their mind on their early retirement. Shaggy conveniently happens to win a trip to an island resort, but it looks like a bayou than an island paradise. And the name of it is Moon Star. Get it, not Moon Scar? Hmm, this couldn't be the same island we went to back when we were adults, was it? Shaggy and Scooby make Fred, Daphne, and Velma promise to not mention or solve any more mysteries. It hurts to say this, but it's really hard to like Scooby and Shaggy here. All this stuff happening and you're worried about a promise? They do this really cheap flashback showing scenes from the first film reanimated to fit the current movie style, and it makes me want to watch that movie again. And because the gang are DH's teens, Daphne's syndicated talk show is now a school project. Not only does it not make any sense, but it's definitely an insult to her character. They all stay at Simone's old mansion, which is errantly called a hotel, and they meet the worst character in the movie, Alice Smithy, a movie director, who wants the gang to star in this film. A lot happens here. There's the Moon Scar Island Trevor that was implied to never be found, actors resembling characters from the original film, for some reason one stunt double, more cat creatures that turn out to be bad guys in mass, except for one who they apply to be real, but by then it's a little too late. Also, Alan goes nuts and burns the only means to escape, and probably the driver as well. But the next scene, he's perfectly fine. He was so passionate about the movie he was making, but yet he later goes fuck it and takes the treasure for himself. What are you doing here, movie? Big shock, I hated this movie. Next to the Velma series, it's definitely one of the worst Scooby-Doo productions. I don't recommend it. In 2020, the 34th Scooby-Doo director video movie was released, Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo. This movie reveals the sheriff from the last two films as the villain behind all the events that happened, and it puts an end to Velma's skeptical arc. It even features appearances from Batman Scarecrow, Bill Knight and Science Guy, and Elvira! Yep, that's right, Elvira. And they utilized her much better than they did in Return to Zombie Island. It was a major improvement from the previous two films. Billy and Mandy creator Maxwell Adams wrote and directed this entry and brings a lot of the irreverent humor from that show in this one. A minor issue I have is I feel they're trying to make the Mystery Incorporated universe the entire Scooby-Doo series universe now. I kinda like how the Mystery Incorporated timeline was its own thing. Apparently the gang's hometown is now in Crystal Cove instead of Coolsville and it along with Fred's mayor dad is even mentioned in the next movie. And I don't think it's really needed. But that's just my opinion. I say give this one a watch, especially during the Halloween season. Sword and Scoob is another one I put in the OK category. It has the gang traveling to England and it turns out Shaggy is descended from a knight who, who stopped Morgan Le Fay from taking over King Arthur's throne as the meddling kids time warp into medieval times. There's a few highlights of this. Jason Isaac is hilarious as King Arthur. Diddle for Nick Frost as Merlin. And some of the jokes you really have to pay attention to. 
I love the shout outs to Ruby and Spears Thundar series. What they do with it at the end is pretty dumb. And this line is cute. Like, I don't want to own real estate. You don't? Man, no way. Do you know how many creepy evil people we've met that do weird things just for a piece of land? I remember this film for its weird color design. Everyone looks way too bright. Also, it's another one of those the supernatural wasn't real or wasn't movies. The way it's revealed the gang did in time travel is actually kind of funny. It reminds me of that Ed, Ed and Eddie episode where the Eds trick Rolf into believing he's back in the old country. It's almost like that. The biggest surprise came later that year with the release of Straight Out of Nowhere, Scooby Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog. This could have not worked, but it did. I said before I love both of these series, and there's enough of this movie for fans of both franchises with tons of easter eggs galore. It's a fun movie. For having no involvement for John H. Dilworth, the team really did their homework at recreating the world of Courage. It was so great to see these characters again and hear the same music cues again. It just puts a smile on my face. This will be the last time Thea White, the voice of Muriel, will perform the character as she passed away before its release. I'd say the only major low point is that stupid rap. Yeah, that's pretty lame. The next film and my second favorite after Zombie Island would be 2022's Trick or Treat Scooby Doo. You might remember this film making headlines because it finally showed Velma as a lesbian. And literally that's all anyone talked about when this movie came out. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad people have the representation, but everyone forgot about how enjoyable this movie was. They switched up the art style yet again and take it from the Guess Who series. I saw the trailer and didn't think much of it, but then when I watched it and saw the opening, I was blown away how fluid the animation was. They must have put more money into these, because I watched the Guess Who series and they never move like this. The story is fantastic. The game finds out all their costumes worn by their past foes were created by one person, fashion designer Coco Diablo, who Velma is instantly smitten with. They finally catch her and send her to prison, but it turns out with Coco gone, the gang are stuck with no mystery to solve and resort to solving minor crimes like tax schemes. This doesn't bode well for Fred, who's itching to solve another case. They get attacked by ghosts that resembles the Mystery Inc. gang, it turns out they need Coco's help, but can they trust her? There's a lot I really like here. Instead of what if the gang randomly got the wrong person, the movie asks, what if the gang were too good at their jobs and a person responsible for their mystery solving capers is out of the picture? I like how they focus more on a gang missing solving mysteries. I love the opening credits featuring a melancholy version of the Where Are You theme. I really love Coco. Her design, the way she moves, her personality, the way she flirts with Velma, she's just perfect. Anthony Carrington for Barry even has a funny role as one of Coco's employees. There's so much fun expressions, posing, and movement animation here, and nice colors and lighting too. And look at these backgrounds. I never thought the Guess Who style could look this appealing. At one point, they played Ballroom Blitz during the chase scene, I'm trying to think of the last Scooby-Doo movie to ever use a licensed song. I don't think that's happened since What's New. I love the scene with all the past villains escape from the penitentiary to wreak havoc on Halloween. So it's not going to go the way you think. They even make a joke about that. It's fun, it's funny, it's beautifully animated. I really enjoyed this. Much like with Goblin King, this is going to be my Halloween tradition for me. It seems like the Scooby-Doo directed video movies will be held by this team. And if that's the case, I'm really hyped. I can't wait to see what's next. Unfortunately, due to Warner Discovery and Zaslav being taxed right off happy, the next film, Haunted High Rise, was the more recent victim of it. It would have featured the return of the Hex Girls along with new songs. I really hope this will be reversed and the team can finish the movie because I really want to see it. And I know you do too. There was another film written off that recently leaked, Scooby Doo and Crypto 2. I'm not going to show clips because I don't want WB on my back, but shortest review in the world, I thought it was fine. And there you have it, the evolution of the Scooby-Doo director video movies. These have been going on for 24 years now, it's amazing. And minus Lego films, I've seen pretty much all of them. These films helped Scooby-Doo reach a new audience for each generation, and have kept the brand alive for years. It just goes to show whether you're a ghost, a monster, or an incompetent CEO, you'll never stop Scooby in the gang. Until next time, I'm 47 Cartoon Guy, and I gotta fly. Scooby Dooby Doo! If you'd like to support this series and many other videos, click the link below to our Patreon.
you could get a special credit at the end of each video and a shout out to your YouTube channel or blog, a commission by me, and now my $5 tier, in addition to early access and special credits, you can request a Hanna-Barbera special or movie for me to review as part of my fantastic legacy of Hanna-Barbera mini Soul series. A lot goes into the making of these videos and your help can make production go smoother. In terms of me paying for software, research materials, etc. And as always, if you're not able to donate, you can help by liking, commenting, subscribing, and clicking the bell icon. I thank you and I gotta fly. I'll catch you later.